Galen, I put on pants today. Congratulations! You I, did it! Why? <laughs> I have to say, though, that they're very restrictive. The, the pants or the expectations? <laughs> Pick. <laughs> the well, pants, though, really, because, like... I, I don't know why... Why did we ever... <laughs> is this is Wait. this my mid thirties talking? Am I just saying that we should all just wear sweatsuits? <laughs> Do I eventually move into a tracksuit? Is that I, is that the upgrade and I become like that like Italian uncle? I I think this is your official transition over to spinsterhood right here. <laughs> just I'm trapped in this denim prison. I don't want any more jeans. <laughs> well, you know what? I'll I'll play along. What was the momentous thing that made you put on actual pants? Um, all of my pajama pants are in the wash. <laughs> yep, that checks. <laughs> I I did have to leave the house though, uh, and I I just got like granola and shit, like whatever. Like, I I needed tea though. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> And yes, that is a beer I'm drinking, and no, it's not before noon, and this podcast is a train wreck. Welcome. <laughs> Hello, my integral pieces of firmware. You are all important in keeping this podcast running. Friends. Very nice. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today on the Nintendo Everything Podcast 107. I am Oni Dino, and with me, I got uh, some heart no, some software. How about this? Some software that could use a little compression. Talk about bloatware, am I right? It's Galen. <laughs> Well, you know, it is a mandatory one. You can restart later, but I'm just going to be right there when you do. So you might as well do it now and get it over with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> You're the software that needs an update every single time. Yeah, it's it's kind of annoying, actually. Like, every time, and you never know what it's actually doing. Like, mm -hmm. I And it doesn't get any better, that's for I, sure. I know! It, it doesn't change anything. It's like somebody, oh, I misspelled one line of code. Let me go ahead and change it. But you're not doing anything. <laughs> Galen, you're looking very svelte these days. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I, I made the joke about bloatware, but like I didn't mean it in like a weight way or anything like that. But then I was like, oh, no, that sounds like I was making a weight joke. And like that's not even funny. Uh, well, over the past year, I've actually lost a considerable amount of weight, so thank you for noticing. I appreciate that. I'm very that. proud of you. <laughs> Your senpai has noticed you. Ah, senpai. <sighs> oh my god. Let's get this over with. We're on all the <laughs> podcast platforms. Just listen to us, please. <laughs> that's, that's terrible. No, don't do that. That's basically what this has devolved to, so... <laughs> Shut up. Uh, Oni, do you ever want me to just like take over and just just for like an episode on the hosting duties, like to give you a little bit of a break or a reprieve? We can try that. It's gonna suck. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll plan that for a future episode. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the adventure log where we talk about the video games that we play this week. Mm-hmm. Galen, I got very little to say about Hyrule Warriors' attack on Calamity. Mm -hmm. You have a lot more to say, though, so which who should go first? You tell me. This, uh, is your, this is your baby steps into the baby pool on hosting. Well, I am very excited to talk about Hades, so how about I go first? And then you can go ahead and wrap it up. Like, it, I'll be the cold open to your main course. That's that terrible. No? It's really terrible. All right. You know what's not terrible? Hades. All right. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I have been playing Hades. Um, for those who have not heard about this game, uh, where have you been? This game is amazing. Uh, this game has been created by Su Supergiant Games. Uh, these are also the people who have made games like Bastion and Transistor. Um, it is a top-down, roguelike action a uh, game with an isometric view, top-down viewpoint. I think I said top-down <laughs> twice. I'm just going to roll with it. <laughs> Galen, 
just can't fit enough adjectives into one sentence. If Galen could create his own language where he only spoke in adjectives, he would. I like my buzzwords. <laughs> no, th this is actually very similar to some of their other games with how it looks. Um, also with how it feels, too. Um, I When I first booted up the game and the music started playing with it, it did have its kind of like Greek origins to it, but it still had that almost Western-esque in inspiration to it with the guitar and the other instruments that they were using while they were playing the music. It, um, it reminded me of Bastion a whole lot. Have um, you played both Bastion and Transistor? Bastion, yes. Transistor, I have it. I haven't played it yet. Okay. Um, but I've heard they were on really sale good recently. things about it. Yeah. Yeah, they, they were on sale uh, recently on the Switch for like uber cheap. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't think I've said Uber in four years. Yeah, that's okay. That tracks. <laughs> it's reminding Fantastic's us... cheap. <laughs> it's reminding us of a simpler time. Jesus. Um, so for those of you who don't know, uh, this game has been out for a little while. It's been in early access since about 2018. However, it just recently officially announced, including on the Switch. Yeah, it was on the Switch and PC, I think. Yeah. Uh, so brief summary of this game you play as the son of hades um a character named uh, zagreus zagreus i think it is zagreus zagreus yeah um and you are just dr zayas dr zayas <laughs> and you are just trying to get out of tartarus like you are done Th this game is basically daddy issue simulator 2020 so um hmm. Hmm. it it is a roguelike game, which I know personally you're not a big fan of. It's very much Me a, personally, no. Well, it's very much a you go through the game, you go through on a single life. Every time you play it, you are acquiring different movesets, different powers, different attributes to it. Um, those aspects are random. And when you die, you start right back at the very beginning. But I also heard that there's a god mode in this, which there is. I didn't know until after I bought it. And now I'm very excited about that. Tell, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I'm ruining your flow here, but do tell us either now or when you plan to tell us about it. What is god mode? Oh, absolutely. Um, but I'll just mention it now. Uh, they do have a god mode in there. So if you are more interested in the story and just the characters that they have in there, it will lessen the damage. It's basically putting the game on easy for you. So mm. if you're not into the like the Twitch-based combat that is in here, you can still get enjoyment out of the game if you play it for other reasons. What what does it do specifically mechanically? It, it just I haven't actually activated God Mode yet, but from my understanding, it is just lessening the damage ma uh, making the game much more forgiving for you okay cool so because i like my challenges it's just that i don't want to like feel like i wasted my entire freaking day playing this game you know mm -hmm. so maybe i will stick with god mode well and and that's what's interesting about this the game also it almost encourages you to die a couple of times in the game because sounds like my real life <laughs> because it's main facet of story progression is when you die and you go back to the beginning so every time you die you come out of this pool of blood and you end up at um hades's like chambers essentially you're like in his main office where he goes ahead and like dictates all of the rulings on the souls that are passing by mm. um but there's this very like casual like hey i know you don't care about me Fuck you too i'm gonna go ahead and go and do my own thing and hades will just be like you know what you aren't ever going to get out of here you're you should just give up and you know stop this foolish foolish endeavor and there's this like weird back and forth that's kind of going along with that why does he want to kill his dad what why does uh, he want to kill his dad? He he doesn't actually want to kill him. He just wants to get out of there. Okay. Um, through plot points in here, you find or he ah wow. I'm gonna rephrase that. <laughs> mm, I'm gonna keep it in there. I'm gonna repeat it three or four times. Go right on ahead. It's super entertaining. Um, <laughs> uh, you find out that your mother is Persephone, who 
if you are familiar with Greek lore, you know she was essentially brought in as a mortal and, you know, it was Queen of the Underworld, but she was kind of like tricked at that same time while doing it. So she's like, she's there, but she's not really happy about it. Mm. Well, she has actually disappeared. And through your first story bit, you learn that, you know, Persephone is your actual mother, not this other person. So you are now following the trail to kind of like follow in her for footsteps to get out of there. It's it's a little vague at the bit of the game that I'm at right now. Oh, but it's cool. I understand that that's kind of the path that the game is going on. <laughs> yeah. With that being said, uh, the game is very tight when it comes to the controls. Okay. The combat is excellent, and it offers you a couple of different ways to play it. So you start off with your basic sword, and it's your standard kind of hack and slash mentality that you're going along with it. I thought it was fine, and I thought about switching back to it, but I wanted to kind of explore the other weapons that they have on there. As you are going through each of these runs, you acquire these keys, and you can use these keys to unlock different weapons in your arsenal. Um, there, At this point, there's also a shield, a bow, and a spear that you can get. Okay. Um, each one plays very differently because you have your basic attack and then also your strong attack. Um, each of them can combo into the, uh, uh, the other. But the like a Muso game. <laughs> but the powers and abilities that you get affect either your base attack or your special attack. So as you're playing, the variety of the gameplay changes each and every time. <laughs> With the bow, you're not really rushing into combat. You've got your basic, you know, pull back the string and shoot an arrow, and it keeps you locked in place when you're doing that. But its special attack is it does a volley and like almost like a shotgun spread esque moment. Mm. Uh, you also have a dash attack, so you can actually combo that as stand, shoot an arrow, dash towards them, hit it at the same time, and then do your volley attack and then dash out and go directly into a dash shot with it. So this sounds exactly like a top down Muso kind of game. Yeah, there, there's a lot of like stringing combos together, and when you add in other elements like. Uh, you can get a power-up from Zeus, where every time you dash, when you end it, there's a lightning bolt that strikes down and does an area of effect damage all around you. He prefers to be called Dr. Zeus. <laughs> Dr. Zeus? All right. Mm. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, is, it just it keeps it fresh every single time. And that core gameplay loop of play, die, repeat, um, just it, it captivates you so much. Hmm. Um, I've I've played other roguelike games this year. Um, You're big into the roguelikes. I, I kind of am. Um, one Step from Eden was one that I mentioned a lot earlier this year that I got really into. Galen has this has this thing to his life. He's, he's missing a component in his firmware uh, <laughs> where he doesn't mind if he wastes his time or if he doesn't learn from his mistakes and he just keeps doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah, no. Well, and it's also nice to see that kind of improvement that goes along with those mistakes, too. That's that's why I am crazy enough to repeat it until I see something different. So, <laughs> It is also kind of interesting in how they actually introduce that element of the replay value into the story. So every time you're playing, when you get a power-up, the power-up is coming from one of the Greek pantheon. And there is a codex that every time you get an ability from them, you learn a little bit more about those characters. Um, and that's not to mention all the other characters that you can meet in there as well. Uh, I was really surprised when I came across uh, Sisyphus. The, he's the guy who pushes the boulder, and then when the boulder falls out, he has to go back, and it's just an internal loop of just pushing this boulder up a hill. And that a is like, Sisyphusian task is exactly. what people say. <laughs> and the, it always has just like one too many syllables in that word that I always screw it up whenever I want to like actually use it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you, you meet him. He's a character in the game and he just he's a really chill guy. Like the first time you say you see him, he's just, oh, hey, how's it going? Oh, yeah, I'll tell him you went the other way. Don't worry about that. We're cool, man. And I, I totally did not expect that. The personality they put between all of these characters is 
really cool to experience, but you also have to go back and run across them at random intervals again too. So like I said, it, it encourages you to kind of reset so you can get that experience there. So for like the game loop for like stages and stuff like that, what are we looking at? Like, do you go up a level and then you get to like a regular like chill area, then you go up a level or what's going on? Mm, something like that. So you, like I said, you start in your, your base camp where you go ahead and select your weapons. Um, you have this mm -hmm. magical mirror that you can go ahead and spend points that you require to permanently upgrade your character. So there is a level of character progression and growth. So you are getting stronger as you're playing this game That's longer. That's good. Um, once you go past that point and you actually go into the, the main world, that is where the procedural generated levels start to come in. So each one is basically one room that you are going through. You beat all the enemies that are in that room. Sometimes there are special conditions, like there's a timer going on and you have to survive for 45 seconds while they send like just a crap ton of guys at you at the same time. Interesting. So you're not like exploring. It's more like you're going through a series of challenges. Yes. Yes. Oh, um, oh. After every... Uh, room that you go through there is usually one or two sometimes even three doors to go through that door will have an icon on it which will showcase the potential reward that you can get when you get through there so do you want to go and get gold which will make your character stronger for that run as you spend it on different things by the way gold doesn't carry over so you lose everything that you don't spend Sounds like real life. <laughs> um, do you go for the centaur heart, which will increase your maximum HP? Or do you go to Aphrodite's heart power up, which will make, you know, your enemies weaker when you play them? Which I want to cycle back and say that the character designs in this game are phenomenal. I oh, really? You get, do you have a soft spot for Aphrodite? Uh, yes. Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, Aphrodite's, um, Artemis, uh, you know, Nyx was a really cool one to come across. Uh, some of the other characters I didn't expect to come up, um, Achilles, like the Achilles heel, you know, legend. Oh, uh, I thought you were talking about the 14th century uh, French <laughs> Impressionist painter, Achilles Le Fleur. Yeah, that's the thing. I'm not so I'm so glad that you, you that. differentiated uh, who you were talking about with this Achilles. Or my um, neighbor, uh, Achilles uh, Morgenfogel. <laughs> he's from Sweden. He's in this game as well. However, he my, also my has neighbor? a... Uh, yeah, he, he's in there. Yeah. Has terrible things to t say about you. So... <laughs> I wouldn't... I wouldn't um, uh, put that past him, that bitch! <laughs> Hope he but yeah, that. he's he's in the game as well, and he also he plays as your like weapons trainer master. <laughs> yeah, just the character design and all the the character design of everybody in here is so fantastic to discover and come across. Uh, the music again is fantastic. I want to cycle around to that. There, it switches between this very chill kind of you know not not necessarily relaxing but just like the ambiance is fantastic sounds like a very visual and oral experience mm, mm -hmm. it's uh it, it just all of my senses felt great while playing this game Ooh, don't need to hear about those galen i'm hearing <laughs> lots of fantastic things uh any negatives with this yet um there is a little bit on the i have praised the story quite a bit but it doesn't do a whole lot to let you know what to look for. So if you're playing this game, I'm going to let you know, keep an eye out for random shiny spots that you'll see. And you'll see it just like a little orb that's highlighting a particular area. That is something that you can interact with. And you've got this weird narrator who there's this weird meta thing going on where the main character can hear the narration and the narrator is like, kind of sassy with his commentary like a little passive aggressive with his commentary on what's going on too mm, that's that's very hit or miss with me yeah it, it's a little weird mostly miss and i'm not quite sure where that's coming from exactly does it not mesh with the rest of the tone of the game 
I, it's just there's certain piece, uh, pieces to it. Like, you'll hear this. It, it sounds like the narrator is describing something in this grandiose um, Odyssey-esque elaboration. Mm -hmm. And then the main character will say something quippy uh, in response <laughs> to that. And The main become character becomes Joss Whedon? Is that what's happening? Not exactly. He does it in kind of like a... a a cool guy esque attitude. Uh, I don't. It's it's weird. It's oh weird. no, Galen, you're <laughs> really un, unselling this game to me now. I I will say that the main character is very likable. It's just it's, it's your definition weird... and my definition of likable though. I mean that's fair to each their own. I I find the character likable, um, but I will say it's a very weird contrast considering the rest of the game. So. Also, it doesn't really do that good of a job on setting up the, like, okay, why are you trying to get out of H or Hades or Tartarus? Why are you trying to mm. get away? Where is this animosity you coming from? Um, you discover elements of it as the story goes on. But mm. I had to beat the first boss, which I died, like, seven or eight times before I actually got it down the first time. Oh. So... It, it took a, quite a bit of work to get to that point. And mm. even then, how you really go through those cutscenes is that you have to go and you have to sleep in your bed after you beat a boss. I just did that because I was curious and I was wondering what this interactable object is. There was nothing that cued... What is bed? What is bed? There was nothing that cued me as to, oh, my character is getting tired. Maybe he should rest or gotcha. anything like that. I just had to go do it, and I stumbled across that bit. So the so, narrative motivation in the beginning is a little bit weak. It's not necessarily that it's weak. It's more of it's not very well explained, and okay. you really have to go look for it, and I wish they would have set up that expectation a lot sooner. Well, this is sounding great. Do you think that you'll you'll continue with it and beat it? Oh, 100%. This is definitely my style of game that I'm that I'm into. Are you so, good enough? Uh, you know what? That's not the point. <laughs> what? That's the point of all video games. It will is true. to be good enough and to beat them and to prove everybody that you're a big man. Yeah. But I also enjoy games that I can jump on every once in a while and just like play until I'm content and then put it down and go do other things. So hmm. <laughs> remember, I'm not a real gamer. That's what I mean. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, that's lovely that we're going to be hearing much more about Hades in the future. Yes, I am can't wait because I know there are more weapons to be able to play as and or play with in this game. Um, I will say uh, my favorite weapon at this point, probably the shield. Uh, would not have expected that, but that <laughs> is a lot of fun. Well, your favorite character in Kingdom Hearts is Goofy, so. I mean, it's true. You know, Goofy for life. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, that's actually bad. I mean, oh. I, I meant to say good, <laughs> oh, that's but actually my default bad. is bad. <laughs> Uh. <sighs> Throw the ball back to me. That's how we play catch on this. Come the f*** on. Uh, speaking of goofy video games, tell us about Hyrule Warriors 2. <laughs> uh, I said the majority of what I'm still experiencing last week, so my bigger impressions are last week. But so far... um. Something I didn't talk about yet is the Divine Beast battles. Mm. So you play, you know, as one of the four Divine Beasts. I don't know what their names are. And your are. Megazords, yes. Yeah, your Megazords. It's, I know one <laughs> is Varudania, Va Meadow, Va Gina. Mastodon, Pterodacto. Sabertooth Tiger! Tyrannosaurus! I, I was always a Dragon Zord guy. I like the da Dagger Flute. Oh, you would be one of those. I also like the color green. <laughs> he was white when he did when he had the the thing. Oh wait, no, he no, was also he was, green too. He was green. It's well, when he I, had the, both of the those talking was... saber sword that he was white. His name was Saba. All right, do not disrespect <laughs> Saba in this house. Hey, I'm talking about Power Rangers words. for anybody who's under the age of twenty five. <laughs> so anyway, uh, oh god, something that really annoyed me though when I was a kid is that like kids would often just say 
their favorite color was whatever their favorite Power Ranger was at the time, and then it would change from like red to green to white. And I was always like, just and choose the color you like. Stop, <laughs> stop fronting. <laughs> stop fronting. That's what I would say as a child all the time. Dragon's Word for life. What am I? What can I say? Whatever, Galen. So, going back to your Hyrulean Zords. I don't really like those battles. Really? Yeah. They're they're okay, but they're a little bit awkward. So you're you're piloting the divine beast and you can see part of it, but it's it's kind of like you're in like a megazord and you're like looking out of mm-hmm. like your cockpit and so you can still see slightly part of it. Um I I like the what do I say like this cinematography, you know, just like your viewpoint. Yeah. I think that's cool. And like your enemies are super far away and you're just blowing away enemies. And that's great. And these when... enemies like uh, Lionels and stuff like that, that were giving you like a ton of trouble on the ground. Then you're just like blowing them away. You yeah. Know? When, when they showcased that in the trailers, I remember thinking to myself that they looked very much like the on rails power fantasy kind of trope. I wish they were more of that. So one of really? my things that it, it this I could see this not bothering somebody entirely, um, but for me, uh, you you basically are at least okay with the the elephant and the salamander. You are going down hallways, and they might mm. turn and stuff like that, but it's basically hallways, and you aren't on rails. You can actually move your zord left and right a little bit, and I always. At least so far. I've only played like one or two of those. Mm. So far, I'm like, you don't need to move these things left and right very much. It just kind of ends up making it feel a little bit awkward because you can move your uh, divine beast left and right a little bit and, of course, forward and back. And then you aim the camera and you have like almost like a 180 view, maybe a little bit less than that, uh, that you can move the camera. So at one point, I was like facing totally diagonal when I needed to be facing straight. And I was like getting stuck because I couldn't see the enemies to my left. And I was like, you know, what's what's going on? Like, why can't I move in this direction? Like, I'm pushing up. Why am I, you know, moving this weird way? And yeah. you can't really tell, like, how exactly you're situated because the camera's not pulled behind your divine beast. So you can't see that you're actually, like, walking into a wall. And from what you can see, like, outside of the cockpit is very strange point of view in, in regards to, like, knowing what's around you. So, like, you... You haven't seen the Divine Beast from this point of view. So you can't really tell that like you're pointed in a weird direction. I think they could have simplified that, at least for these two um, Divine Beasts. I haven't played the other ones. Okay. Uh, with these two, where you're just going down hallways, it would just be cool if it was like completely on rails and all you had control of was like forward or backward. And, mm. you know, so that way you, it wasn't like a on-rail shooter, like Star Fox or something going at, at one speed. Um, but then you can control the camera and then that way you can shoot your enemies and stuff like that and you can go backward if you need to but there's like no real reason so far for me to like completely go left or completely go right and i don't know it's just it adds to like the slowness and like a little bit like clunkiness of those battles where it's so starkly different from like regular battles where you have full control of your character and stuff and i guess in one aspect i do like that just that it feels so different but yeah well, and you mentioned earlier that um, when you get a chance to pilot these things and you are taking out these really tough enemies that you used to have a lot of problems with, mm. for me, I feel like that kind of a moment, because this obviously this is not the first kind of game to be able to do something like that. Yeah, yeah. I feel like those kind of moments are a little bit of a cop-out because they don't make you feel the the power of the moment in a sense like i feel yeah, these like these do though they do okay yeah because I, I was about to say that there really needs to be some sort of like momentous thing when you are in those devices to really like something that you are changing the landscape you are blowing chunks out of the side of a mountain or something exactly like, that happens that does happen okay yeah. good that was my biggest concern exactly the way you were describing that it, i was kind of thinking that it was just like oh look all the lionels are now the hobgoblins or something like that no 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 and they they have the bacoblins in there fake gamer uh and they have a whole bunch of other enemies in there 
the uh, uh, like the Lionels are in there and like the big tougher enemies like Wizrobes and stuff they're in there and they take a lot of damage to take down so they're still difficult they're not just yeah. like fodder um, okay, and they're okay, the ones good. that'll really screw you up uh, so you know looking at it a little bit more positively with like what you're saying like you are blowing off chunks of landscape uh, and that really is cool you feel strong you get lots of different attacks you have basically a normal attack and a strong attack whatever that might be for the things so let's just mm -hmm. take the elephant for example i'm sorry i'm i'm killing somebody listening to them by saying <laughs> the elephant i think it's varuta is the name of that i don't know they're just the, whatever whatever made up names uh the element uh, element elephant see i can't even do the english good <laughs> it shoots like really quick like ice beam lasers like mr freeze and okay. you can shoot those really quickly and then it has a strong attack where it has to charge up so you can't keep using it and it locks on to all the enemies uh that you s uh, swipe your camera across and then it fires out a big blast from there and that's really cool then it has to charge back up it also has a defensive move every one of the uh guardians has a defensive move and they structure that i'm sorry I, by the way my new chair it it, it squeaks it does that and i, I hear it sometimes on the, on the <laughs> recording and it bothers me i hope it's not bothering anybody else i'm sure it is now that i just mentioned it and brought a bunch of attention to it anyway uh they have defensive moves and they structured the enemy placement and enemy types around the defensive moves so the elephant has like a what I want to say, it's like an anti, like an anti-missile kind of thing. So like when okay. the Lionels shoot these laser, or sorry, thunderbolt arrows at you, you can't shoot them out of the sky really. You have to press your defense move and then you activate like anti-air stuff and then it shoots that out of the sky. But it will only do that if you do it properly. So these battles are actually pretty tough and there's like strategy to it it's not just like okay because you really have to think okay so so it is a little bit of a hmm it does sound like it's a pretty different change in gameplay compared totally. to the it's rest of it completely different yeah other than that though like they're, they're okay it's just that sometimes they go on a little bit longer and then like if you die which you know sometimes happens with uh, the challenge battles because i also have this game on very hard mode because i'm wanting the challenge but then if you die it's like redoing it again it's like ugh. but that's sort of a bit of a self-imposed challenge that i'm doing on myself so i can't really can't fault the game for that yeah 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 other than that like things are going well i'm still very surprised at how incredibly long the main levels are like well over an hour uh for these battles which is crazy considering the other hyrule warriors was like 10 to 15 minutes for battles yeah and they have challenge battles and stuff that are that short or even shorter uh but the main levels are just so crazy long which i like because it is so different from other warriors games and i really just like that it is differentiating itself um but that just kind of <laughs> means i can't really play it at night Right before I go to bed, because I don't have an hour and a half to play a video game right before I go to bed. No, and that... <laughs> 20, 30 minutes tops. Sleepy Oni is sleepy. <laughs> I, just, I don't have it in me. I'd say you need your beauty sleep, but it's more like you need your sanity sleep. Listen, I'm also very beautiful. <laughs> I'm a solid six, okay? Or a drunk six and a half. So, have you come across any new characters that are really, like, you're enjoying playing as? Yes, I have come across one, and maybe light spoiler just for who the characters are. It's still fairly early on, but just FYI if you don't want to know, because I'm almost done with the segment, so if you don't want to know who this character is or whatever, uh, go ahead and skip ahead. It's the one right after you get the uh, champions. Mm. So if you, if you have mom? this character, then what? Is it a dead bomb mom? No. <laughs> oh, no, it is not. It is uh, Hestu. You don't remember who this is. I do not. <laughs> the big Korok with oh. the maracas. Oh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I completely love forgot his name. <laughs> I'll, I will not let him know that you said that. 
he he plays crazy like everybody just plays so uniquely and so mechanically it's great he he can summon little summon little koroks and uh that's that's just a lot of fun he, <laughs> he fights with his maracas and his dancing it's precious absolutely precious <laughs> Speaking of the Koroks, I know that they are hiding everywhere in the game. Have mm. you been able to, like, come across them pretty, like, is it obtru obtusive trying to, obtusive, obstructive? Yeah. How much of a pain in the ass is it to find these things? There we go, Galen. There we go. <laughs> uh, not not at all. You know, you just, you just have to be looking at your environments and be willing to explore, you know, maybe go down to see what's down that dead end path, that kind of thing. Yeah. And yeah. that's also just something that I'm so glad that they nailed because if this were like, you have to beat this stage in 30 minutes to get an A rank um, and you're still running around and trying to find those Koroks, it would end up becoming a nuisance because you'd have to replay the levels several times in order to get the A rank and also to get all the Korok seeds. And that would just be annoying with this. There's no, there's no like, penalty for uh staying in the levels a long time and exploring them mm -hmm. you're encouraged in in that regard because then you can find your koroks and stuff and you can actually take your time in this game which is wonderful because the first hyrule warriors game is definitely like if you sit around you will die like y your characters <laughs> will die and everything will go wrong in this yeah. one not so much and i think that that's also i, I heard one person i don't remember where it was it was on discord and i don't remember if it's our discord or not um which i didn't even say our discord i didn't even say our twitters oh whatever. you skipped right past the beginning stuff that's fine go that's on. fine <laughs> ignore it it's episode 107 they should know by now yeah <laughs> they know yeah. the train wreck that they are going to be getting <laughs> i think i said that in the cold open too well, maybe um this beer is not very good uh da, 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 da. What, what were we just saying Oh, uh, uh, what was somebody complaining about on Discord? I'm drawing a complete blank. Holy crap. What were you we were just, just talking, talking about? about. This you is were collective just talking dementia. About... <laughs> okay, news. <laughs> so, re really quick. Oh, um, what? <laughs> given the... Uh, the length of the levels and how it is kind of interfering with your regular gameplay time. Do you think you're going to still be playing it some more? Yeah, definitely. I'm having a great time. Good. I just, I, I am going to be able to play it less. <laughs> Boy, do I not have free time these days. <laughs> I've been like working seven days a week for four, five weeks now. And I just, like, keep thinking that, like, it'll settle down. No. It, it hasn't it, and it, it isn't. It will not settle down unless you make it settle down. I'm trying to make it. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> Why won't you settle down? <laughs> okay, then, Nuss. Uh, okay. I believe you. Jump in the line. Now we're talking about news. Caitlin, okay. <laughs> tell me about the Switch firmware. Yeah, so the Switch got an update this month. I don't uh, care because it doesn't have folders. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this was a little lackluster. So it has some very quality of life improvements, if you can call it that. Um, very behind the scenes stuff. So you've got these auto download backups of the save datas that are going on a little bit more frequently. Um, they've added the ability to transfer your screenshots and videos to your smartphone or your computer, which I would say is a good thing, but they do it in a really convoluted way and it makes me really angry. No, no, no. There's two ways and you, you only make yourself angry because of your own stupidity, Galen. There's two oh, ways. One okay. way, one way is with the QR code thing that you're probably talking about. Which is a load of crap. <laughs> Why don't you mention that before I, uh, destroy you? <laughs> okay, so basically what it's doing is it is having your smartphone, it puts up a QR code on the screen, you scan it with your phone twice. The first time is to go ahead and establish a direct connection. Now, the reason I'm frustrated by this is because it conflicts with the mobile data in the phone. So sometimes when you are trying to reconnect to the Switch directly, 
it will not work and you have to rescan it a bunch of different times just in order to make that connection. And then you have to scan it again to confirm the actual pictures that are being sent over to be able to download them to your device, which it seems very counterintuitive. And I feel like there are much easier ways to be able to do this with that same level of security that they are trying to achieve. So you can also just plug it into your PC. Well, yeah, you can do that too, which I haven't tried that one. Of course you haven't, because you have to do the gadget. You have to do the gimmick. What? <laughs> What's more so convenient? I, I'm playing Hades and I come across uh, Aphrodite for the first time. And I'm like, wow, this is a character that's really weird. I want to go ahead and show this to my wife. So took a screenshot, went to go ahead and do all those different steps. I didn't think to pick it up, bring it over to my computer, plug it in, download it to my computer, and then send her a message through there. It would have made a lot more sense just to do all that through the phone. But it's an equally convoluted method in order to make that happen too. When it doesn't need to be, that's the thing. You could also just upload it to your social media and tag well, your wife in it. I could, but my wife doesn't use social media. I'm just saying, like, it, it seems like an oversight. And it seems like extra steps to do something that didn't need to be there. I, I guess that's, I'm just being picky and I recognize no. that, <laughs> but I wish it was a little bit easier and it worked a little bit smoother if they are touting this as one of the main features of this update. Galen, this is Nintendo we're talking about. I, I know the user friendliness is never part of it. Do you have amnesia? <laughs> it is a crapshoot. No, oh, that's true. The, this feature, though, uh, really saved my life. I forgot that this was on there, despite having used it. Uh, it super saved my life. I needed to get a bunch of photos and video off of my Switch uh, for work. And mm -hmm. it was literally the next morning uh, that they did this update. So I was able to just plug it in and get it uh, all off there. And it super saved my life. Because I was like, it, oh my is god. It <laughs> is it really a, kind of a plug and play experience when plugging into the computer? Yes, it's just like plugging your phone into. Okay. Yeah, that, that is a little bit more encouraging. Like, don't get me wrong, I, I'm glad that this feature is now there. Yeah. It's just with the most, uh, what I think is commonly used way of doing it through a smartphone with the way that we consume technology nowadays. I wish that step would have been the focus on making it a little bit easier. So. Yeah, but I mean. If it's not broke, don't fix it. You just plug it into your PC and then it's done. But it is broke. <laughs> no, I'm. Uh, you're Galen, talking you about just like you're, your, talking your about new method things. B. You like your you're, new things. I'm also. I also recognize that I'm complaining about a feature that was given to me for free. So you know, grain but, of salt. But <laughs> uh, you can still criticize a feature, though. You know, I think I, you're levying completely uh, valid criticisms. Mm -hmm. Like you. you there's two different aspects there. I don't like it when people say that kind of thing, like to shoot down your criticism because it's like, well, it was free. So you can't criticize like, no, you can criticize. You just like, you're not criticizing the aspect that it is free. You're criticizing the functionality of the feature itself. You know what I mean? Yes. No, I get you. That's just people being like, don't complain about the thing that I have associated with my personality. And I think that that's <laughs> lame. Yeah. Yeah. Well, moving onward from that don't go through all the features well there really wasn't much more like they do have a cool thing where you can prioritize your downloads so if you're downloading update a and game b you can do game b before the other one gaming is saved yeah and then they threw some icons that you can make as your profile picture which i don't imagine anybody will actually use and they gave you user preset buttons so that, of course, leads me to the last one, which is probably the weirdest one, and that is the big ol' red Nintendo Switch Online icon that they put on the home screen. Yeah, I don't really like how it just kind of sticks out there, you know? Yeah, and it's it's there purely as advertisement, because you can't really do anything with it other than buy the service or remind yourself that you bought the service. Yeah, like, I think I went into it once on the Switch home menu, and it's, at least right now, I have an idea, or I have an idea, I should say, uh, I have a feeling that mm. they're going to utilize this a little bit more as, like, a hub for things, but right yeah. now, you're right, it is just, like, a little advertisement. 
Mm -hmm. And the, the fact that is literally the very first thing on that bottom row of icons, and that can't be modified or moved in any way, is very Nintendo. Uh, <laughs> but very obnoxious, if you were to ask me. So. Uh, you know, I don't find it as obnoxious. I don't know if it's because of like the other stuff that um, PlayStation and Xbox do with advertising mm -hmm. to you. Like the other day, Cliff turned on the PS4 and he goes, you downloaded Fortnite? I was like, I didn't download no Fortnite. And oh then yeah, they've been doing that a lot more lately. They constantly it's... put uh, icons on your damn home screen in addition to the splash images that they put above the icons that you're on and below the icons that you're on. You know what I mean? And like, that stuff drives me nuts. I was hoping that the PS5 interface was going to be better than that. Um, I, I, have, I don't have a PS5 or anything like that, but somebody I was talking to that I really like their opinions on, on these kinds of things, they said uh, that it's going to just be... They predict that the PS5 interface is just going to be overrun with ads in the future. And I was like, oh, oh my god, that. I hate that. I hate that so much. Paying to get advertised to well and they're they're blending the whole trending atmosphere into it directly and exactly because they want to advertise to you exactly yeah exactly i understand <laughs> from a from a business perspective for sure but as a consumer i hate that i very much hate that i think it's <laughs> awful what what are you laughing about? Wait a minute. no 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 i just thought of something so my wife and i are rewatching 30 rock right now and we just went into the episode where they're trying to pitch ideas to Cable Town for NBC. And Jack comes up with the idea of, okay, we're gonna do this thing where we just put a gigantic black bar on the bottom half of the screen to avoid anything that may be racy or, you know, sexist or anything like that. And then they also pitch the idea of advertisements being used in that space too so they can make even more money off of this idea. And I just realized that's basically what we're talking about right now with the way that they're changing up their trending screens. Yes, but fake 30 Rock fan Kenneth came up with that idea and Jack didn't have any ideas and he stole it from him in the very last second. Yes, I know. I literally just watched that episode before. Do you? Because you didn't say that <laughs> Kenneth came up with that idea. Uh, commencing eye roll in three, two. It's stuck. What? What the fuck stuck. was that just now? What the what the fuck? Are you on like the set of Firefly with that Joss Whedon shit? What the fuck was that? I have... commencing eye roll. Are you Buffy the Vampire Slayer? Fake Thirty Rock fan over there. <laughs> Iconic Liz Lemon quote, and we are completely getting off topic. That's not a... I... Yes! Yes! I will send you the freaking gif! It's not iconic. That's what I'm saying. How, how do you mean it's not iconic? That she does eye rolls is iconic, I guess. But the commencing eye roll thing is weird. That show is great. This update was mediocre. That's all I'm saying. I need folders. That's really the punctuation on this. Right? I genuinely need them. It's not just me being like, boo, folder. Like... I, I have a lot of games on my Switch, and mm -hmm. it's overwhelming. It's like walking into a toothpaste aisle, and you see 500 types of toothpaste. You can't choose. You know what I mean? I need to sort them. I need to organize them. And I don't I know don't... why they don't have it when they put that in the Wii U. And they put yeah. that in with the Wii U like fairly early on. It was one of the earlier updates, if I recall correctly. It was they before... already have it for the 3DS. Yeah. Yeah, they did that as well. Yeah, I don't know. I, I wish I'm right there with you. I would love it if they put that in. Genuinely, please give it to me because I, I need to play my games in a way that doesn't give me anxiety. Yeah. And this whole most recently played thing just gets, you know, everything gets shuffled down really quick. Yeah. All right. Uh, another moving it real quick along in the mom. <laughs> that is the sound this next game made. There's a demo out now for Wonderful 101 Remastered on all the platforms. And this is a special demo. It's got Wonder Bayonetta in it. Mm -hmm. And your progress transfers over. It's like two hours of content. It's great. If you haven't played yeah. that game yet, it is a great time to play it. Galen, what's your favorite thing about Bayonetta? About Bayonetta? Yeah. Um, 
it's a pretty good action game. That's a great alternative to Devil May Cry. <laughs> um, honestly, I've only played the first Bayonetta. Um, I'm actually a lot more familiar with Wonderful 101 than I am. <laughs> You, you and nobody else. What? What if one one is a good game? It was, but nobody played it. Well, Coming now this can be your chance to change that, because I want to point out that the game is also on sale for only like 28 bucks on the uh, USC shop right now. Yeah. And it will be for a couple of weeks, if I remember correctly. Oh, interesting. It's like a week, it's like a week or two. I thought it was going to be like just a... Like a Black Friday holiday sale type thing, but apparently it's going on for a lot longer than that. Cool. So try so. out the demo, see if you like it. Buy the game. If you like it. <laughs> Only. Kami san will be very happy. What's your favorite thing about Wonderful 101? Uh, I like the 95th person in it. Mmm. Wonder Green? He's number two. No, wait, number three. I'll take your word for that. <laughs> oh, oh, Mr. I know all about the wonderful 101. I never said that. You're putting words in my mouth. There's a lot more that can fit in your mouth than words. <laughs> Galen, speaking okay. of fitting things inside of your mouth, why don't you tell me about, about this next game? Do I have to? What do you mean, what do you right. have to? Guys, Doom Eternal came out for the Switch. If you haven't gotten a chance to play it and you were waiting for the Switch, cool. Comes out December 8th. You said it came <laughs> out, and then you said now it comes out. You get your words together. That's what I want. That 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 is a little bit of a jumble. So, Remember the Doom Slayer? This game has been delayed quite a few times, but it is finally coming out. I, I think it's actually been like almost a year. Like initially, well, it, all of the platforms, it was supposed to come out in like December. Well, yeah, of last it was year. originally supposed to come out really soon, and then I remember that the main game came out literally the same day as Animal Crossing. Yes, in and March. They, and they that was even after a delay. Yeah, yeah. And they were expecting the Switch version to come out like a week or two after when it was originally being planned. They definitely said like shortly after, yeah. But then it kept getting pushed on further and further. Yeah, so. yeah. <sighs> I personally am not that big of a fan of the Doom franchise. Mm. Uh, I can respect it, though. I've heard really good things about the game from a, like, I almost want to say, I don't want to call it a casual first-person shooter area, but it's no, more it isn't. of it's, a... No, it's really intense, and I don't think that, like, a casual first-person shooter would really uh, do very well with this game, actually. Yeah, well, and I'm just thinking more of, like, the way that FPSs are... And kind of like perceived nowadays, where when you think of that, you're thinking definitely have multiplayer, definitely have all these other facets. It's no, it's kind of your a very meaty experience, more meaty than you would get from a regular um, FPS, like a Call of Duty or something like that. Mm -hmm. Which sometimes doesn't even have single player content these days. Exactly. <laughs> Um, one thing that I did find really interesting about this, though, is when they were talking about this in their. Uh, press announcement they specifically mention in here that you can improve your aim with a control option of, that allows you to use the gyro controls this option can be used in conjunction with the control stick for the perfect blend of immersion and accuracy which i found was interesting because you don't see that a whole lot nowadays but when i think of other games that have also tried to do something like this um Resident Evil 4 for the Wii was really um, praised, uh, specifically the Wii version, for that kind of point-and-shoot mentality. <sighs> Metroid Prime 3 was also one of the more popular ones because it had that kind of a control screen uh, scheme, and that was something that was new and exciting. But it's yeah, kind of they even like redid uh, or re-released one and two with updated controls mm -hmm. on the Wii. And you find other games too, like Pikmin Three, and even the the deluxe version has a gyro uh, control scheme in it as well too. So Bethesda's been pretty good about their Switch ports, and I don't know why they don't do this on other platforms or why other platforms don't want it. Um, Bethesda's been good about their games that they release, like Skyrim. Uh, you can use gyro aiming for like your bow and arrow uh yeah. same thing with wolfenstein that you have gyro aiming and i really really like gyro aiming uh with first person shooters 
and I don't yeah. I don't play first person shooters at, uh, much at all. But uh, any time that I do, I enjoy something kind of like Doom or uh, like Zombie U, of course, I always go back to that. But that yeah. way I can use my control stick to make the big sweeping movements and then the uh, gyro in the control to make these little tiny movements. And yeah. it's it's not it's not exactly like, you know, aiming with a mouse, but it definitely has a similar feel of like having a little bit more like finesse to it and i just find it so much more enjoyable rather than playing a game with a stick and with what's that called aim correction or something or aim assist aim i assist. hate that like i i turn <laughs> aim assist off in if i ever play a game that has a gun in it like re2 or something i turn aim assist off immediately i hate the feel of that yeah so uh, anyway i wish gyro was used in everything because like, there's gyro sensors in the ps4 controller you know so like uh, yeah yeah. Well, and I, I definitely agree that gyro should be an option that should be used more in these kind of uh, yeah. circumstances. Um, I especially like what Nintendo has been able to do because with the Wii mode and with the Joy Cons, you have that almost that freedom of movement within your hands as opposed to like moving a controller around and trying to aim it that way. Um, what? I remember. What? Well, what? I remember playing... Yeah, what Breath you're of... saying is a train wreck. What are you saying? <laughs> Let me put it this way. I remember when I played Blur Breath of the Wild and realized that they had the uh, the gyro sensors in there for aiming the bow and arrow. Yep. So I found myself using that a lot more when I had just the Joy-Con separately from the main system versus if I was playing with a pro controller or just holding the console as a whole oh really i i always like when i'm playing in uh tv mode i'm always using the pro controller and i like yeah. the gyro feel of that mm -hmm. and i mean the pro controller still has a um great uh what's the word i'm looking the sensors in there are do feel very accurate when you're playing it so um, it's just, I don't know, something about that freedom of movement of being able to move your hands around while you're still trying to aim. Uh, with Joy-Cons, you're saying? With the Joy-Cons, yeah. It it does add to the immersion. At least for me. You're a train wreck, Galen. Everything about you. <laughs> on to the next, what's the next thing going on? Uh, the Good you? Life. Swery's game, The Good Life, that we've talked about a bit. Uh, that's the mm -hmm. one where you are a photographer from New York. And you move into a uh, tiny town in the English countryside, full of a cast of wacky characters, I'm sure. Uh, there's a new release window for it. It was going to come out in 2020, but then they were like, we got to push this back. It's coming out in summer of 2021, and they have a publisher. Publisher is called, what the hell is their name? Irregular Corporation. Thank you. And I had to look them up because I was like, who is they? <laughs> they uh, have published several different games, but Murder by Numbers is one that people will recognize here. It was oh, the Picross yeah. uh, visual novel game that I played part of and kind of fell off of. But yeah, that's great. That's good, good news. I'll be playing The Good Life when it comes out at some point. I honestly had to go back and read or watch the trailer on this because I had completely forgot what this game was. Well, tell us all about it. What is it? Uh, it's basically Swery's take on Animal Crossing. That's that's what I got from it. That is entirely wrong, and you should feel bad about what you just said. <laughs> everybody well, turns into cats. Correct me. Everybody turns into cats or dogs at night, and you just there's mysteries, and you're like, what is going on? And then you also the lady's name is Naomi. Uh, you also have to pay off your debt as a photographer. I I really liked in the trailer that I watched. They were like, "My name is Naomi. I'm a, I'm a photographer from New York." But they said it with the Japanese language track in there as well. Yeah. So it it was just something weird for me of hearing in Japanese, "I'm an American from New York." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> New York から来た Naomi です. Yeah, that, that's it. <laughs> I, I actually haven't heard her Japanese voice, so I, I don't know what it is, but I have a feeling it sounds like that. Sort of like in uh, a very self-confident Japanese lady. <laughs> you want to be wrong. 
Arama, something like that. She's one of those those ladies. <laughs> On to the next, Galen. Uh, tell me about the opening of Death with Super Nintendo World uh, in the USJ. Yeah, yeah. So United the, Studios um, Japan. Universal Studios theme- Japan. <laughs> they're making a theme park based on the Nintendo Wii U demo. Um, I wish. Super Nintendo World Theme Park is opening up at the Universal Studios in Osaka, Japan on February 4th. The, the entire place is 100% decked out as a Super Mario level. There are piranha plants. There are Goombas that are just kind of, you know, stomping on by. There are is literally a trail of Yoshis that are just kind of floating on by. It's it's a sight to behold. I highly recommend going and seeing the, uh, uh, the trailer that they put up on it. We got all the trailers on NintendoEverything.com. Mm-hmm. Um, what's also really cool is that they have an actual attraction ride in this, in which case you are doing the Mario Kart Koopa's Challenge, I think it is. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, but you're playing as Mar- as a Mario Kart. You are playing as a Mario Kart. <laughs> um, right. It, you get into a cart, and it's two rows of carts on tracks, and you are actually racing against another person. Now, everybody who is on the ride gets to wear these AR goggles, and they are touting that they've been working on this for the past six years from a technology standpoint. And it is supposed to be completely immersive in the sense that you can use items just like in Mario Kart to be able to throw them at the, the other guys, and each experience that you have will be different depending on if you win or lose on the track. Wait a second. Are, is ride. it not like an actual go-kart ride though when you're you're driving around in on a track in real life? No, you, you're you're on a track, but there are there's a steering wheel that you have. Um it's kind of weird because there's a steering wheel for each person in the cart, so I don't know how interactive that's actually going to be. They, they so there's AR that. plus real things happening. Yes. Yes. Weird. <laughs> but yeah no it, it looks like it's gonna be a lot of fun um this all takes place in bowser's castle and they have things like a gigantic stone bowser statue and physical mario kart trophies that are all up on display i saw those uh, trophies there's lots of pictures of those trophies they're very beautiful yeah um it's really neat some of the reporters who have like gotten a chance to look around and are kind of like publicizing it, um, they are saying it's a, it looks to be a little bit on the smaller side. So they're wondering how that is going to happen with uh, like COVID restrictions, which uh, let's face a reality here. That's probably still going to be a thing come February 4th. Yeah. So. And the numbers aren't really going down. Yeah, exactly. And um, <laughs> amusement parks are a nightmare anyway, man. Like, there's cool stuff there, but Jesus Christ. Like, I don't mind being in gigantic crowds of people. That's not, like, a problem for me. Like, I, I love, uh, I loved living in Tokyo, you know, and being on crowded mm. trains. That didn't bother me. But being in a, a nightmare situation with people running around like jackrabbits, it's just awful. Awful. Yeah. I hate amusement parks so much. <laughs> um. Other than that, though, yeah, th- this is something that they've been working on for a really long time, and it's finally coming together. We finally have a, you know, a launch date for it. Um, and Ugh. if you want to mask up and risk it, go for it. Let us know how it is. <laughs> is it worth it? No. The answer is no. It never is. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. This it just sounds like such bad timing, but if they've been working on this for six years, it's not like they have a whole lot of choice in the matter. Well, so that's, that's bullshit. What? <laughs> what? That's, that's full of nonsense. Why are you so full of bees? Why am I so? I, I don't know. You Tell so us. Many... <laughs> and lastly, I thought it would be kind of fun with the game awards coming up next week. Uh, which we'll be talking about inevitably. Mm-hmm. Well, let's look at the big one, the game of the year that they're going to be having. Oh, um, I wasn't even going to talk about that. All right, fine. Let go. <laughs> uh, right now, there are six contestants in the running. You've got Animal Crossing, Doom Eternal, 
the Final Fantasy VII remake, I know that's your personal favorite, uh, Ghosts of Tsushima, Hades, and The Last of Us Part Two. Who do you think what will win? What do you think? You, 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 you first. Honestly, Animal Crossing. No, who do you... Okay, okay. We have to make two predictions on, on these kinds of things. Who do you want to win, and who do you think will win? Because those are two very things. Different I things. Going, I forgot I my adjective. I am going to double down and say Animal Crossing for both of them. Wow, really? Yeah. So, to be completely fair, I don't see Ghost of Tsushima winning. <laughs> Tsushima. Shit. <laughs> Ghost of Tsushima. Sh- 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 I, I don't think it had the critical response that it needed in order to really kind of get that attention going. Hades is fantastic, but the fact that it has also been uh, as an early access game for a full plus year, I don't think it deserves to be a game of the a game of the year award winner. Um, I can't speak to Last of Us Part Two. That is a very good contender, and I would not be surprised if that ends up taking it home. Um, Final Fantasy VII, I think because of how different it is and how much uh, controversy there has been in the the opinions of that game, there, I think there it hasn't be way been too that much controversy. It's it's seriously like so overwhelmingly loved. And I'm one of the few odd men out on that game. Well, and then you also have Doom Eternal, which, I mean, you're going up against some of these other heavy hitters. I don't think it has enough, like, force to be able to push it through and overcome everything as, like, the best of the best. Okay. Now, with Animal Crossing, okay. it has record-setting numbers that has far surpassed everything anything else that has come out this year in any other game franchise but they don't care about any of that like none of, none of these none of these are it has iconically been a game that everybody has been talking about it has consistently been a game with all of these free updates that they have been pushing through it's been a platform for social expression which is something you don't really get in video games far too often in this genre I think it checks all the boxes. You I mean, know, like, I, I for make... you, yeah, but, like, for the, the awards, I just... They don't care about any of that stuff, you know? Well, yeah, they, they care what Subway thinks, so... God damn it, Galen. You know I was going to make that joke. No, I didn't, because it's such a bad joke that I forget it every time. <laughs> I think maybe The Last of Us 2 will win, because mm. that's just... That's, like the oscar equivalent of a movie about hollywood the they just eat that shit up you know what i mean so i mm. think it'll probably be that and then what should win i don't know hades because it's the, the underdog <laughs> otherwise i don't care i think animal crossing should win i think animal crossing will win but i will not be surprised if the last of us part two wins gotcha all right and then uh, just about uh, like things that are kind of Nintendo related or whatever. Uh, mm-hmm. What do you think? Like, just make a prediction. What do you think will be there that we might know about already? Honestly, I think we might have a repeat performance and they'll announce some sort of new Smash Bros. character. I've seen a couple of, you know, leaks on like, uh, like voice clips that have been data mined out of the Smash Bros. game le- recently with some like recent updates. Um... I don't remember exactly what characters that they were talking about, but if they're starting to plant those seeds, we might see somebody new or at least get get an a, idea on who the next one will be. Mm-hmm. Maybe not actually see any gameplay, but you know how these things go. I feel like Smash Bros. Might, <laughs> Smash Bros. might be uh, losing a little bit of steam, you know? A bit mm-hmm. of it is with, you know, the DLC being... I don't want to say delayed, because we don't really know that, but it just, like we only had two characters this entire year, you know, and like yeah. it kind of makes sense with COVID and stuff like that. But just, I don't know, I feel like they need something big to bring it back, and I don't think that they really have that under their belt, maybe. So I don't think it'll be that. Maybe we'll see a previous game or something like that that we heard about before, like think about it in 2017, maybe. Bayonetta 3, uh, that was teased or announced there. So mm-hmm. maybe we'll see something like that. To, to be completely honest, if you were to break this down, I... It's weird, 
because the absence of a proper like E3 showcase has caused a lot of like um what's the word I'm looking for? Disorganization. Poop. Oh. <laughs> when it comes to game announcements, particularly for this year. But the quote unquote game awards and what they have been trying to brand themselves as as almost a new platform for those kind of world premieres is i mean i expect to see a lot of stuff coming out around this time that they were not able to announce earlier now with that being said um i expect a lot of the world premieres to be galen do you need to take a bathroom break you sound really constipated I mean, I wouldn't mind one, but I can push through. Ugh, bad choice of words. No, that was um, the best choice of words. <laughs> that was a great choice of words. It was a great joke, and you didn't even mean to do it. See, that's why That's why improvisation is wonderful, Galen. That's why if you prepare jokes ahead of time, they're never funny. Uh, this is why we're friends. Yeah. <laughs> um, But, ah, shit, what was I actually going to say? Oh, see? <laughs> shit! Funny stuff! Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, no, what what I was going to say was... Um, I feel like a lot of the world premieres that we are going to be seeing are going to be focusing mainly on the next-gen consoles. We are going to see oh, yeah, yeah, much yeah. more of Sony and Microsoft stuff than we will of Nintendo coming from here. That's so true. I don't expect a whole lot of Nintendo stuff from this year's show. I doubt there's going to be really, you know, when you say that, that makes a lot of sense. There's probably not going to mm-hmm. be a whole lot of, like, reveal brand new things. There's just going to be, like, new gameplay trailer, new info to stuff that we already know about. And it's going to be primarily for uh, the new gens. Yeah. And I, I know that Nintendo will come out with something. I just... I have no idea what it would possibly be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we just we know that there's you know a couple of games in the pipeline. Um, yeah, no, 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 we'll see. See you next week. <laughs> Additional DLC. Mm-hmm. Here we are. Additional DLC. Ba-da-ba-ba-da-ba. Why? Why? I haven't done a like intro outro musical thing. I mean, that's in a while. fine, but that was McDonald's. No, the McDonald one goes ba da ba ba ba. Oh my god, what is the difference? <laughs> we have it on on f- film tape. The listeners can tell us that Galen is ridiculous. Our our Discord was talking a lot about fast food for some reason. I have no idea why. <laughs> hmm. Anyway, I'm recommending a lovely, lovely uh, collection of videos. Actually, we posted about it on NintendoEverything.com. Uh, oh, I just remembered a piece of news that we should have talked about, but that's fine. Uh, th- this modder, uh, not this modder, but this group of modders has begun rebuilding Hyrule in Breath of the Wild using assets from Age of Calamity from before the Calamity. Uh, so they're like rebuilding the game in that engine which is really cool it's always really fun to see modders doing like things like this and they're great videos you should check them out they're on our website galen what about what uh you know what tis the season so i'm gonna recommend something of a i guess you can call it a christmas movie this year um i'm going to recommend a krampus a straight to tv film called the hog father now this is actually based on a terry pratchett novel of the same name in his disc world uh universe don't and call it, it a universe well i mean what would you call it it's from the disc world series series. <laughs> series uh it follows the story of the hog father who is basically you know santa claus um but it also follows the adventures of death Like, the person, Death, who basically finds out that the Hogfather is missing and has to go ahead and fill his shoes to keep the spirit alive. In the meantime, his granddaughter, Susan, is going around and trying to find where the Hogfather has actually disappeared to. Um, There are wizards, there are wacky assassins, there's the Tooth Fairy. It is a philosophical hodgepodge of just 
weirdness that is Terry Pratchett, and I absolutely love it. So Terry Pratchett's a good guy. Yeah, uh, it's always been one of my favorite ones. It's a lesser known one, so definitely check it out. I actually have a uh, I found a YouTube person who has the entire thing uploaded. So definitely check it out. It's like a four part thing. Hmm. And now on to the listener mail. We have the place that you can send us the emails. It's called an email. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Nintendo everything pod at gmail.com. The email that you can email us at is this email, nintendoeverythingpod at gmail.com. But that's not all, female. We also have a Discord yeah, channel. Um, you can also send us messages on our special Discord question section of the podcast. Yes. Just as... <laughs> Lovely, lovely gentleman named Mog. And actually, we, these questions are both for me. Uh, sorry, Galen. What what, uh, what can people ask you about? Before we get into these questions, what can people ask you about? About your, your life and your skills and your specialties? Why don't you put out a few seedlings and uh, reveal tad bits of mysteries about yourself right now? What mysteries would you guys like to know? That's half the fun of finding the mysteries in, in, in of itself. You could simply ask, why am I the way that I am? I'll tell you, but not until you ask. <laughs> I tried to set you up. I tried to lift you up. You were too heavy. Also, I'm also going to put this out there. I may have some more embarrassing photos of Oni from a younger age. So, Oh my god, why do you those, cling to my to personality? About that. <laughs> Never, ever. Man. I, I really want to show them the video of us going to the Nintendo Switch event. Oh my god, shut up. <laughs> All right, read, read but, what Mog has to say. Yep. So, Mog writes in, question regarding translations. How well can good writing shine through a bad translation? Can bad writing be fixed with a creative and well-done translation? Thanks for writing in, Mog. Thank you, Mog. Mog is, is just a lovely gentleman. He's he's really very smart, and he says very interesting things, sometimes in gigantic text blasts, <laughs> and I, I love it. Absolutely. I, I always really enjoy reading um, when people have like a speciality or just some kind of uh, like niche knowledge about something. It, it just fascinates me. I love learning from other people. Anyway, this is definitely a two-parter. So the first part, how well can good writing shine through a bad translation? Mm -hmm. uh, it can very, very easily shine through. Well, I shouldn't say easily, but all right. So here I have to set up the process of like what, you know, a typical official translation will go through. So you have your source text, like let's just say uh, Japanese to English, just because that's what I do. Um, and Mog also, Mog, he speaks Japanese as well. Um, I don't think that he is a translator, but I mean, you know, you know, he, he speaks Japanese, so he's, he's familiar. Um, mm. So you have your source language in Japanese. There will be basically a first line of defense. Think about this as lines of defense in, in a war or something like that. Your first line is the translator. They translate the Japanese to English and they make sure that the nuance gets across and they leave a whole bunch of notes on things that an editor, the second line of defense, will need to know. After all that is done, a editor will come in. This person may not speak Japanese. More often than not, doesn't speak Japanese. They might have a little bit of knowledge, but they are their their primary job is to rewrite the translation into a very natural sounding and creative uh, script. And then after that, there will be a proofreader making sure that all of the characters have uh, parody in their voice and making sure that all things are consistent, you know, phrases, terms, uh, in addition to things like punctuation and whatnot. Um, and then depending on the size of the project, there may be maybe not a proofreader and there's maybe just a translator and editor. Or if it's a huge project, there will be multiple translators and multiple editors, even multiple lines of translators and multiple lines of editors to make sure things go smoothly. So that's kind of the basic you know, way that, that it functions. 
Um, you can have people, and this is very problematic, be bad translators who have good output, and they just put a terrible translation on there, and the editor is like, what are they saying? Or they've completely missed the nuance on this, and that's only if the editor themselves speaks Japanese. And in that case, the company is lucky that they hired such a good editor, um, mm -hmm. because the translator is just putting, like, basically garbled nonsense or basically machine translation on there and it's missing the nuance it's incorrectly stating things writing down characters names wrong like just all kinds of bad stuff so um like i have a, a buddy in particular who had this exact situation happen a terrible translator and he was the editor and he basically had to request a bunch of extra time and retranslate everything and rewrite everything. So it can be done, but uh, based on you know how I set up the process there, you can see that the the chips are stacked against the editor in that situation. So it's really important that you have qualified people for all of these. Oops, sorry, I just hit the mic a little. Uh, for all <laughs> of these parts in the line of defense. That's why it's important yeah. you pay translators and editors a fair amount because if you undercharge then like a good translator isn't going to go for that because they can't feed themselves over it and then somebody who isn't a translator who wants to get into the industry but is maybe you know not ready for that type of job yet is going to choose the really low paying job because that's all they can get and um companies some companies i should say don't care about what the end result is because they got the product out and that's horrible you know like that's why it's really important to pay people what they're worth. And that's yeah. a huge problem in the translation field. Like we, we constantly are getting underpaid. <laughs> uh, cycling back to the, the core of the question itself, can you think of any examples in particular of just like something that you thought the writing seems really good, but it was just so poorly translated. Like you picked up on the story beats that it was trying to get. Or, hell, a game that you've actually played, both in Japanese and in English, that you've noticed the difference between those two. Um, not really, because if it is something that had a bad translation, but then good writing to back it up, it's not immediately apparent to people unless you are playing with both languages side by side and you yourself are bilingual or at least bilingual and more often mm -hmm. than not a translator because translation skills are different than just being bilingual you know uh i really can't think of something off the top of my head like that like that i know it happens i know it happens you know yeah and i, I think it's a little bit more prominent that that write that and, <laughs> and make those things up yeah i i feel or i should say i suspect that it's a little bit more prominent in things like films where it's um if it's translated over but the subtitles are it was very poorly translated when it was brought over you can really miss the nuances of what the original film was trying to get and then when you talk about like subtitles and stuff too there's also the craft of being a subtitler and the subtitler mm. themselves, they might not speak Japanese or, you know, the source language, but they have to know when and where to end things um, in time codes. And it, I, I haven't worked with a subtitler before on something like this, but I would imagine that if it's possible, work with a translator to be like, oh, uh, this moment needs to land at this specific spot because it's a joke or whatever. And in order yeah. for people to dedicate that amount of time, they need to be paid well. And that's kind of my, my end all with this is that like you need to pay people so that way they can put out a good product because if you pay them crap, then they, they can only work on it as much as they are getting paid. You know, even a really tr talented translator at some point they have to be like, I can't kill myself over this. I'm getting yeah. paid half my rate. You know, it's, it's ridiculous because talent definitely shines through and it can make or break a project, but that same talent and this applies more to just than just like video games or media this can be viewed in almost any industry where there is a gross like oversimplification of what the what is expected to do the duty and what you actually need in order to do the duty well mm -hmm. um it just it, it boggles my mind that there is such a disparaging gap between those oh totally totally yeah so 
And then uh, onto his second question, which is a, a shorter answer for sure. Uh, yeah. Can bad writing be fixed with a creative and well done translation? So what he means here is bad writing in the source language. And the answer is totally like, yes, that happens quite frequently where uh, even in my personal experience, I've had things where I'm like, what, what are they saying here? Like I'm, I'm missing something. And then like my initial thought is like, I personally am missing something because my understanding is not good enough or whatever, or I'm missing like a bit of a cultural nuance here. And then I'll ask a friend who is culturally Japanese and they'll be like, oh no, this is just bad writing. And I'll be like, oh, phew, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm not an idiot, you know? And then you have to get creative with it, you know? And that's, that's part of it is having creative writing skills is so important, um, whether you've written fan fiction before you've role played on forums before that's you know maybe something that doesn't really happen too much anymore but uh written your own stories before mm -hmm. creative writing is so important and that's why like an editor being skilled in creative writing is great and if you have the great combination of a translator who understands nuance and understands how to communicate that to an editor and then an editor who knows how to take that and then write something fun, uh, that's just the best, you know? Like I, yeah. on a project that I'm working on right now, my editor is really fantastic and she asks lots of great questions and she, she's just always asking lots of really good nuanced questions so that way she's sure that she is able to be creative without losing the original meaning and that's part of it too is just knowing when you can step up to the line versus stepping over the line you don't want to um you know lose that creator's intent yeah and uh but, but at the same time if, if that's to fix bad writing you know like you can be like okay i understand as the translator what this writer in the source language was going for but wow did they flub this you know like this wasn't a very good joke or whatever but i understand that this is a punchline or something so let's write yeah, it up yeah, yeah. in english we're, we're good writers over on this part of the project that i can control so let's write some good jokes here and there's been <laughs> when i have those little aha moments in in you know projects that's so fulfilling and i love working with my editor on on things like that and just being able to yeah, to get that in the game. And then, you know, yeah. wait a year and a half for the game to finally come out. And then somebody mentions <laughs> the joke or like laughs at the joke. Like uh, a game I translated that one of the, uh, what are those called? VTubers. Uh, one of the VTubers played uh, the, the shark girl, Gouda, Gouda something or other. Hmm. She played uh, Kokoro Clover. And it was really cool to see her play and read out the dialogue. But then she would laugh in between the bits. Um, at jokes that I put in there and it's like yay like you know people like my my writing it's it's always such a wonderful feeling to be able to write creatively yeah y you know <laughs> all sarcastic jokes aside and everything I've always been very impressed with your not only your ability to translate but also the modesty and respect that you give to the craft to almost make it this like reverent source of him of inspiration so thank you galen I, you're welcome I, I don't know what that compliment <laughs> really was but thank you very much it's very kind of you you're good at speaking the not words thank you <laughs> <laughs> and thank you mog for sending in such a very interesting question yeah thank you thank you for asking <laughs> about uh translations i'm always really happy to talk about translations because i think that that's a part of media that doesn't get talked about enough you know writing yeah but we also have one more semi-translation related question uh this one is from deku deku what hey, up deku dude? <laughs> deku writes in do you have a keyboard that can type u.s characters and japanese ones or do you just change language settings which changes your hotkeys i'm just curious since presumably your job uses japanese frequently Yes, uh, I have a English keyboard, and then I just switch between the languages using hotkeys. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I have a, a PC, so Microsoft has 
language settings and you can install the different languages and support for different languages, including like spell check and stuff too. Uh, yeah. And then you just switch it using whatever hotkey you want. So I think that I use, and this is how frequently I, I switch between the languages, like hundreds of times per day. Um, I don't even know what my hotkey is because it's a muscle memory thing. I don't know. I think it's the Windows button plus space switches my languages between English and Japanese. And then when you're okay. in Japanese, you can switch between US keyboard and Japanese keyboard. So then I think I use control shift or maybe control caps lock. I don't know. You can change all that stuff <laughs> yourself. Uh, I um, Oh, go ahead. Oh, I, it's just I have a keyboard i actually use a gaming keyboard at work but it's got a um a row of macro keys which i specifically use for the work programs that i do because a lot of my hot keys are kind of like key bound to that particular thing nice. um so with if i press the g1 key it does my you know shift control p to get me to this one screen on this other program nice. so i love that yeah. kind of shit for like when you're doing basically your work because it it shaves off so few seconds and you can work so much so time quickly. You know what I mean? So much time. Um, especially when you get into like with my particular job, it's a lot of repetition with the going through the various screens and mm. what it is I do. But um, there's also a lot of timing that kind of goes along with it. I've actually been able to like, think out how long it takes the computer to recognize the key inputs that I'm actually putting in and create a macro commands that can automatically enter in those spaces. So if I need to, let's say, print out a bunch of cost, like a cost analysis paper, for example, I could, as a keyboard, do my control G O P which will go ahead and go through the different screens on the, like the menu screens on the top. Yeah. Bring up the other one and then control P to print out that page and shift F1 in order to actually confirm the print to the printer that I want. Yeah. Instead of doing a whole well, bunch of clicks and moving over on screen to screen and everything. But it gets even better because with that macro command, I can literally time all that out. So I literally press one key and it does everything in the perfect timing yeah yeah that's really cool so you love those yeah. kinds of gadgets it's how my brain works <laughs> um and even with uh editing audio i have all of the things that i do very regularly all hot keyed so all of my post-processing effects are hot keyed um mm -hmm. splitting deleting uh split i don't even remember what it's called it's called like split delete or something like that uh, joining, all that stuff, raising the volume, lowering the volume, all that is hotkeyed to just my left hand. So my left hand is always on the uh, keyboard, my right hand is always on my mouse, and I never have to really move stuff around so much, and it just keeps you yeah. so much more focused. Uh, but one thing I did want to say with like Deku's question, uh, I when I was going to school in Japan, even Japanese students would use the English keyboard. There were, like on the keyboard itself, there will be a whole bunch of extra marks in addition to the Roman letters uh, for yeah. typing Japanese. And it is so, it, it's like using a keyboard for the first time if you've never done that. So I, it just, it was not worth my time to learn how to do that when all I can do is just type in um, the Romanized version of Japanese. Uh, which yeah. uses Roman letters and it works for these two particular languages. And it, it just is so much faster that way. And uh, yeah, even the Japanese students, like most often they would use the English, the English way of, of uh, letters and writing the Roman version of Japanese out. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you both for your questions. Yeah. Thank you, Deku. And thank you again, Ma. Yeah. If you have a question you want to send over to us, whether it be translation, personal life, video game, just tell us to shut up and stop rambling, whatever it may be, send those emails to nintendoeverythingpod at gmail.com or swing by our Discord and drop us that question in our podcast section. The links are in the description. Yay! Yay! You're a wacky arm inflatable tube man. Uh, that was more of a Kermit, but I, I guess that kind of looks like a 
ball wacky waving arm flailing inflatable two man well let me be your miss piggy and say hiya <laughs> i'm a tired what's coming up what's coming on nintendo everything.com lots of news lots of reviews lots of translations lots of translations lots of translations Stay connected to us on the Twitter at Nin Everything. Also got the YouTube, youtube.com slash Nin Everything. And uh, what else did we say? Oh, uh, Twitter. Galen, what's Twitter? You can always reach out to me on Twitter at Mobius087. Uh, at Oni underscore Gino. <laughs> <laughs> Galen, it's late at night. All of our it listeners, is. all the kids are getting tucked into their beds. Tell them a d- bedtime story. Well, there were once two friends who were very sassy with each other. And they decided that they wanted to be entertaining and share their sass with the world. Little did they know, there was this evil monster called Reality that crept on in and showed them just how wrong they were. And the moral of the story, kids... Don't start a podcast. It's uh, it's a lot more work than you think. It is rewarding. But it, you also end up having to stay up really late. The end. We'll see you next week. Until then, have a nice bedtime story for every time Nintendo... What? <laughs> for everything Nintendo? <laughs> stay tuned to Nintendo Everything. Go to, go to sleep. <laughs> Bye bye. Later, everyone. Stop, stop, stop.